doesn't matter. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good morning. Welcome. Sorry about that. My, my name is Andrew. I want to welcome you to Thrive. It's so great to see you all today as we continue our life story series. And uh, if you've been, if you spent any time with us at all, if you've been a part of this community, one of the things that hopefully you've heard me say, or more importantly, better yet, hopefully it's something you've witnessed and felt is that we desire to be a church that loves our neighbors, that loves our community, that cares about the good of our city. And we are not content to be a community that exists just for ourselves, but we desire to be a community that exists for the sake of a better world, of a better neighborhood, of a better community, for the sake of blessing our neighbors. And we believe that we are blessed to be a blessing. And we want to be a church that if we were gone, people might actually miss us uh, because they felt like we do good and that we care about them, that we see them. And, uh, and I was at a burger place this week. I try to have a, a faithful presence at a few places in town where I try to be a regular and, and just get to know small business uh, communities and just be invested in, in their good and, and I try to be faithfully present in a variety of places but there's this place that I was meeting with a guy who a friend of mine that I was inviting to come be a part of this church be a part of this community and so I took him to one of my regular spots and we were talking about what it looked like to get involved here at Thrive and what it might look like for him to come check it out for the first time and the guy who works behind the counter who I've developed somewhat of a friendship with uh, we've never really talked about church or Christianity, and he overhears this conversation. He says, you know, I grew up in church my whole life. He says my uh, Sunday school teacher was my aunt, and then I graduated to the next grade, and it was my grandma, and I graduated to the next grade, and it was my uncle when I was in church my whole life, and I am not involved anymore. I don't go, I don't choose to be a part of church. I have moved on to I don't know, basically better things. But he said, you know what, there's one thing that always stuck with me when I was in church. One defense of why I believed it might be real, why I believed it might be true. He said, I learned that the early Christians in the Roman Empire, when standing differently and, and disagreeing with the people around you or the government, meant that you could be put to death, Christians believe so strongly in loving their neighbor that they would befriend and love and serve people when it was against the law and be put to death for it and be put to death for their faith in Jesus and they didn't care. And he said, man, that, that always stuck with me that that was, maybe there was something to this thing. And so I thought that was really interesting and, and certainly I think that there's a great history, there's good and bad in the history of the Christian church in our world and in the Western world, but I thought that was interesting. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, do you believe that the church in America represents those same values? And there was a pause as he decided uh, how close of friends we were, I guess. <laughs> and simply he said, no, with an element of finality as if and I'm sure you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But no. And so we continued the conversation and, and I just said, well, you live here in this neighborhood. If there was a church in your neighborhood, what would you want it to be? And we talked for a while and I could get into that. But I, I wanna bring our, our hearts and our minds to this thought. Of, of what would it actually mean to be a people who are radically and recklessly concerned not with ourselves but actually at a cost to ourselves perhaps the good of our city and what kind of people would we have to be? What kind of community would we have to be? What kind of church would this need to be for the people in our neighborhood to believe 
maybe you yourself today to believe that we exist for your good. That our God that we just sang about is not against you, but is for you. We've been going through this life story series in which we've been tracking the storyline of the Bible. And we started in the beginning with God's design when he spoke everything to existence. And he said, this is the design for the world. And there were certain things where he said, this is how the world works best. And God was the king of the universe. And so we were to listen to him and obey him and trust him because he was a, not just a king, but a father who cared about us and wanted and knew what was best for us. And yet we... Uh, turned away from that. We said, no, no, we want to be the ones who decide what is good, who decide what is right, who set the script and make the plans. And so even though he spoke everything to be good, we broke away from that and we experienced brokenness. And we learned in this series so far how we've experienced brokenness in our relationships. We broke brokenness internally where we experience shame and guilt and fear. We experience brokenness on a societal level where entire systems are, are broken and neighbor is fighting against neighbor and there's violence and hatred and division and oppression and inequalities in every part of life. But then we're in this part of the series where we say God came. He came into our story. He didn't say that was the end of the story. He said, I'm going to be involved. And so he started setting together a, a group, a community of people who were to be set apart, were blessed to be a blessing. And it started with Abraham and we've been tracking a promise that, that God was going to bring a descendant, a child, who was going to save the world, Jesus. And so we've been tracking from Adam to Noah to Abraham. And we learned about the story of Moses and what God was doing there, bringing together a family until we got to David. And we learned last week that eventually this coming child was going to be a king. And what kind of king is God? He's a king who gives up his life. Well, where we left off in the story last week, we're covering sort of human, the story of human history. And we're in roughly 1,000 BC, which may be uh, before your memory begins. But 1,000 BC, that there was this kingdom, this nation of Israel in the Middle East where God was working and God was trying to bring them together. And he said, you're to be a kingdom of priests. Your whole existence, your whole function as a nation is so that when people interact with you, they're to understand the love of God. That's why you exist. Well, what began to happen is they began to live for themselves, and they set aside God as king. They said, we don't want God to be our king. We want to have a king like all the other nations. And so generation after generation, even though they were called to be a blessing to the world around them, they were living selfishly until in... 722 BC, this is a history, some of you guys are not into history, you're like, you're hating this, it's okay, you don't have to remember the dates, but about 300 years into it, like 80% of the nation was brought away in captivity under Assyria, and they lost all of their nation to, as prisoners of war, 80% of it, and then in 586 BC, the rest of it was lost, so Jerusalem, where the temple is, all the stuff, all the history of Israel, all the places that you can go to today and see this land, they were wiped out by a conquering Babylonian army. And in the midst of that, there was a 12 or 13 year old boy named Daniel. And Daniel's family probably all died. And his city that he lived in was burned to the ground. And the temple where he worshiped God uh, was defamed and desecrated in a variety of ways. And he was taken as a prisoner of war from Jerusalem to Babylon, where he was basically forced to join the Nazi youth, where he had to uh, be kind of brought up in the ways of war of the nation that had just conquered. And so where we're going to pick up the story in Daniel's life is he is, right, um, th think of his life, what he would have been experiencing. He's experiencing living under Nazi occupation. He's experiencing like being a, a slave on a plantation. 
he's experiencing, maybe if you want to think of it in a different way, like coming to a new country and maybe you were a doctor in the country you came from and, and now you're washing the dishes in the country where you arrived. He's, if you've ever seen the Hunger Games, he's Katniss Everdeen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so his life is rough. Okay. He's, he's in a hard life and he's a teenage boy. And all of his people and all of his tribe and everyone he loves, everything they built, everything they thought that God promised them is gone. It's gone. It's all taken away. Their churches are, are gone. They're, you know, they had their temple system, everything they did, their way of life, their, their jobs, their family, everything they had ever built, everything they had ever known was gone. And, and Daniel is this just like young, prepubescent, early teenage years boy experiencing all of this. And you can go read the whole book of Daniel and, and, and watch his life story and how he dealt with that. And he is one of the only people in the Bible that uh, it never really says anything bad about him, which isn't to say he was perfect, um, but he really dealt with some adversity, right? Maybe you've dealt with some adversity in your life. Maybe adversity like not to the degree of some of the things we're talking about, but you felt like you were outcasts, you were on the outside. God's people were refugees. They were refugees. Read with me, if you have a Bible, Jeremiah chapter 29. And here's where we're going to pick up the story. That God has the prophet Jeremiah write a letter to all the refugees. He says, this is the letter that I want you to hang on to. This is God saying, this is what I want you to know while you're in this situation. And I think in reading this letter, we're going to learn about the reckless love of God for neighbor. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 1. It says, These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles. Right? So he's saying the people who made it out of Jerusalem, the people who made it out of, of the, like the army that came in, the people who got back, brought back as prisoners of war, these are the people that are left. This is who the letter is to, to like this young guy Daniel. It's to them and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar, that was the foreign dictator, whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisah, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Okay, you don't need to remember all those names or any of the dates or anything like that. It, um, but they're real people. I think it's important for you to recognize. These are, this, is, this is not like a made-up story. It goes out of their way to mention these people who are in this real situation. It says this is a letter written to these folks in this hard time. And he's saying, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to, to feel. Now, before we continue, I want to provide one other kind of piece of clarifying information. I want to explain to you why God allowed their nation to be taken away. The prophet Jeremiah had told the people, you read the whole book of Jeremiah, which is more than we have time for today. He basically said this. He said, all of your religious institutions and all of your worshipers are focused on gaining wealth and taking care of themselves. It says, all of your institutions have become corrupt. And instead of worshiping me, and instead of loving the poor, you do everything to chase your own dreams and take care of yourself. And he says, in that, when you fail to love me, when you fail to love the poor, when you only take care of yourself, he says, you're failing to love me. You're, you're worshiping a different God. And he says, and on top of that, he says, your, your preachers, your prophets, your pastors, your ministry leaders, 
He says they are guilty of preaching a false message. And he says in Jeremiah 6, he says they say peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so he says you've developed a religious institution where people show up to be told God's going to give you whatever you want and you don't have to care about hurting people. He says, God is saying, I've blessed you to be a blessing, and you have built yourself a system where people build crowds based on the message of the problem is you're not blessed enough. And so God said, if you won't love your enemy where you're at, then I will send you to where your enemy's at so you are forced to see them face to face and to go deal with them. If you're, God says to Israel, if you're not going to love the nations around you, I'm going to send you to them. I'm going to take away your holy huddle. I'm going to take away your big church, your mega churches, your systems that are built around hearing what you want to be told, and I'm going to send you to them. See, when God's people had wealth and power and positions of influence, when they were the ones running the show, something happened in them where they made it all about themselves and they forgot that they were blessed to be a blessing. And so now they've lost everything and he's writing to them and he's saying, here's what I want you to know now. And so I say all of this to say, I think there are two categories of people in this room and honestly, most of us, most of us will identify in some ways with both. But some of us, have been guilty of a me-centered uh, uh, sort of religion, religiosity, where we think all of Christianity exists to meet my needs. <laughs> all of Christianity exists so that, so that people can see the world the way I see it, so that my dreams can be furthered, so that my goals can be accomplished, so that I can feel better about myself and so I want to go to a church where the music is just like I want it to be, where the preaching is just like I want it to be, and the people treat me just how I want to be treated, and I've got friends who are just like the kind of friends that I want, and we, we, we filter every part of our religious experience through what am I getting out of it. And this is, what, and this is why God took away their nation. He said, I'm done. God said, I don't want to be a part of that. But there's a flip side which is that now God's people are living as refugees among their enemies. And they're hurting, and they're broken, and they're wounded, and they're poor, and they're afraid. And some of us here today, we come, and, and part of the reason that we, that we have that, that sort of self-focus is because we're just incredibly broken. We've just been beat up by the world. And, and we're living in, in a world in which this, everything rages around us. And we're just going, where, like, where do I even fit here? Like, where, where's, my, where's my family? Where's the people who care about my needs? And, and you're grasping, you're hoping, you're saying. And so, and so some of us, right, are tempted to always feel like we're the ones hurting and never see the hurts of others. And some of us are really hurting, and no one seems to care. And, and I think for all of us, we can say, like, we live right here in America in the richest nation in the world. And so in one sense, all of us are incredibly privileged, from the least to the greatest. And yet, also, some of us have experienced being an outcast in church and feeling like we never fit in and feeling like I came to church and I was supposed to be loved and nobody was looking out for me. Or, or man, I, I didn't grow up and I didn't have that family that other people seem to have and, and I don't know what to do with that. And, and so we, we experience both. We experience both, right? And so God's message is going to be the same for, for either crowd. For either crowd. God's going to say the same thing because sometimes we're both, right? And the Israelites were both. They were both. They were guilty of self-centeredness, and they were the victims of mistreatment. They suffered, and they caused suffering. They sinned, and they were sinned against. So what does God say to us? How do we respond? 
And, and what I'm about to, to, to cast for you as, as we read forward are sort of steps to deal with being in a broken world. Steps for us to, to take to, to, to bring healing and, and restoration, really, really practical steps that God gave the people as they were living in, these, in this exile. Here's what he said. Here's the first thing. Put down roots in your community. Here's the letter, verse 4. The letter said, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. So here they've been taken away from their home. They're living in a foreign land. They're living among their enemies. And he said, I want you to build a life. He said, I want, you to, I want you to go build a house. I want you to plant a garden. You know what? It takes a long time to build a house. It takes a long time. You plant a garden, it takes a long time to get corn and tomatoes. And you eat a lot of it to feed your kids. He's saying, put down some roots in your community. Wherever you are, settle in. Make your place your home. You may be staying for a little while. You may plan to stay for a long time. Well, however long, you have no idea how long you're going to be where you're at. Where you're at, put down roots. I'm not saying you can't ever change or you can't move or you can't take the next job. I'm not say don't hear me saying that. I'm not saying don't have dreams. I'm not saying don't make plans for the future. What I'm saying is where you're at, be where you're at. Does that make sense? That's what God's saying here. I had a, um, we, we were talking about, I didn't know you were going to ask us about uh, any teacher that made an impact. But uh, I was in college uh, 10 years ago or so now, and I was a freshman. And there was a, a returning senior who was like 30 years old, which at the time seemed really old to me. I apologize for that now. <laughs> and, but there was, so there was this 30 year old returning college student who was living on campus for some reason. So he was like 30 and everyone in the dorms was 19 and 20 years old, okay? So he was in, he was 50% older than all of us. And he had like, had a career and lived on his own. And we were just like these kids who were sort of trying to be adults for the first time, living in like housing that somebody else planned for us. And, and we were just sort of kind of taking our first steps and it would have been tempting for this guy, his name was Matt, I remember it so clearly, he had a beard, I still can't grow a beard, I definitely couldn't grow one then. I just remember really big bearded, old, I'm putting that in quotes, uh, Matt started making friends with everyone in the dorms. And he would invite us to go study with him. And he would like have like a movie night in his place and he would invite like all of us over and he started befriending all of us. He was just planning on being there for nine months before he graduated, just finishing his degree. We were all going to be there four years. We were all in the same life stage. We all had all these things in common. And he said, no, no, I don't, I don't fit here. I don't belong here. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be on the whole journey with you. But while I'm here, I'm going to put down and for nine months, he invested in our community, and then he, and then he left. He was only there a short time, but, but while he was there, he was there. I don't know where you're at. And in life in the city, and for so many of us, it, could, it can feel like it's changing all the time. And your life can feel so in flux, and stability can feel so far away. And for these people, in this context, so far from home, stability felt like a dream that they could never have. And God said, I, I just, where you're at, I just, I want you to, I want you to make it home. Are you invested where you're at? In the places you live, work, and play? At your job, at your home, in your neighborhood? Hey, your grocery store, the places that you live and work and play, is it your home? Are these your, are, right? Is this city your home? Or, or, or are all these people just strangers? What would it look like if you began to believe 
that the community you lived in was your home and that the people here were your family. Which brings us to the next point. He says, verse 6, Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. That you may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, and do not decrease. He says, start building your, your family here. But I think this is something really crazy. This is even more important than this. Remember, this, this, they're a very small minority of people who've had their families all destroyed. It's not like they've got this whole built-out community. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I want your kids to marry the Babylonians. He's saying, I want you to become friends and family with your enemies. And this, and this, and Jesus is going to say this really directly, right, multiple times throughout his ministry, over and over and over again. You've heard it said, you, you know, love your neighbor. I want you to love your enemy. And God says to the people while they're in exile, I want you to family up, marry up with all these people that you hate, that took away everything. That's an intermarry with the enemy. Now, at the time, right, this, this interracial marriage was radical, radical. But it's not just interracial, it's also interfaith, something that, uh, you know, in terms of marrying somebody of a different belief than you, right, which is something that the Bible consistently also says not to do. He, God breaks his rules here. And, and I think he's getting at something really deep. God's saying, if you're going to be effective for me, you've got to form serious, deep bonds, deep relationships with people who are very different from you. People that you do not understand, that you do not like. And they may be from a different economic status, they may be from a different culture, they may be of a different age, they may have a different political opinion. And he says, I want you to become friends, I want you to become family, I don't want you to just be an acquaintance, I want you to have real relationships. God says, I want you to invest deeply in becoming friends with your enemy. Now think, think about this. Like, Think about this, okay? So this, I'm about to get, I'm about to make everybody angry. Okay, so, so everybody right now is talking about what's going on in Georgia, right? With the laws that just passed. And I've got two worlds that I live in, and I have people who are angry, 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 angry about the way that women are treated in that. And I've got friends who are angry, angry, angry that, that, that people don't care about the unborn, okay? And sometimes it's good to be angry because we care about someone. And sometimes we're angry on someone's behalf, right? And so, and so we have people who care deeply about someone or something, and they're passionate about what they feel is the good of their community. They care really deeply. And God is saying, I want these two groups of people to get married to one another. <laughs> and I want them to become friends and I want them to start talking life and understanding one another. This is crazy. Nobody in here wants that. That's every Thanksgiving. <laughs> and you go down the list of the most hot button, divisive, angering issue that people deal with. And God is saying, I want you to learn how to talk about it. I want you to, to learn how to understand. I want you to learn how to listen. I need you to love your enemy. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of Christianity. Because you, you find some way to enter in a type of relationship where you're not viewing the entire world from your seat, but you're trying to somehow get up and sit in their seat. And not that you're leaving your convictions and that you're not leaving the truth. You're not leaving the things that God cares about behind. But you're finding some way to, to, be, to love the people around you. And God asked his people, because they weren't willing to do it, 
He said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to put you in a situation where you are going to learn this lesson, that this is why I sent Jesus. Because I don't want you to get really content talking to yourselves, feeling good about yourselves. I don't want you to just make a point somewhere in a room by yourself. I'm going to make a difference. I want to see change happen. So how does that happen the next step? So we've got to put down roots. We've got to start to see the community we live in as our home and as our family. And in that, then, we have to somehow learn with this weird family where we don't all get along and we don't all see things the same way. We've got to find a way to, to begin to love our enemy in the midst of that. And so three, we need to maintain a faithful presence. Verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts and God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. So he says, you have all these religious leaders who are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. He says, stop, stop just with your, your feel-good, therapeutic memes and, and search for something deeper. Get past the sound bites and, and, and dig a little deeper. He says, and I want you to pray. Oh. Oh, we need to pray. As if God actually is capable of doing something. As if God actually cares. As if God actually hears. He says, I want you to pray. But don't pray for yourself. No, no, no. He doesn't say pray for everything to work out for you. He says, I want you to pray to the Lord on behalf of your city. For the welfare of your city. I want you to begin to pray that the people in your community, that your enemies would start to prosper. That, they, that their families would grow. That they would become rich. That they would succeed in their dreams and in their jobs. He said, I want you to begin to pray for the blessing of your enemies. And I want you to begin to pray that the city you live in would flourish. Whether you get anything out of it or not. But then he says, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. God says, I'm going to tie the good of my people, his church, I'm going to tie it to the welfare of the city. To the degree, he says to his people, that you're serving the good of the city, you will experience blessing. And he wants them to dig deep, to not just listen to what other people are saying, not to just trust even people like me, but he wants them to dig into the Bible and listen to their neighbor. He wants them to take these incredibly complex issues and not make them simple, but to care deeply. Daniel came over as a young preteen boy and he went through all the regiments of the army for his enemy and did what he was told and then at various points in his life they made it illegal for him to pray and he prayed anyways but God helped him get through some of those situations and we find out if you go read Daniel chapter 9 that when Daniel was like 81 years old he read this letter <laughs> He's re he reads this letter he finds it at the end of his life after 70 years of living in Babylon He's been in Babylon almost 70 years. And he's been forced this whole time to trust God with his future. Read with me verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, back home to Jerusalem. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. After 70 years of living in exile, he's 80 years old, he's at the end of his life, he's about to die. He reads this and he realizes that God's about to to bring him back. He's about to bring him back home. He's about to end the suffering. He's going to end the years of war, the captivity. He's going to let him go home. And God says, I have a plan for you. This is not the end of the story. But this is what's crazy, and this is what I really want to see. Seventy years was his entire life. You see, Daniel had a faithful presence for 70 years, and then he died. And he did it for his kids. He did it for the next generation. You see, God makes this promise, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to take care of you. But, but it, was, it wasn't for Daniel. Daniel didn't get to keep it. It was for the next generation. And we live on this earth maybe 70, 80 years, 60, 90, whatever we've got. And the whole time, we live in exile. We live in a broken world. And there'll be good days and there'll be bad days. There'll be days where we feel like the world's becoming everything we always wanted it to be. And there'll be days where we feel like it's getting worse by the moment. And Daniel had to trust that maybe some of the promises of God, that he wasn't going to experience them until he got to heaven. That maybe some of them weren't for right now. But maybe, just maybe, they were going to be for his kids, for generation after generation, and they were going to be his forever in heaven. And, and friends... To love the people in our lives. To, to exist for the good of our neighbors. We have to trust. Oh, we have to trust. That God, even when he's not operating on our timeline, even when it feels like we're spending our whole lives struggling, even, even when the plan that, that we have doesn't seem to match up with what God's doing. In, in all of that, the only way that we're going to ever be capable of doing the first three things, the only way we're going to be able to put down roots and, and become friends with our enemies and have this faithful, God-representing presence, the only way we're going to do it, the only way it's going to be possible is to believe that God has a plan. To believe that this overarching story that we've been reading from Genesis to Revelation, this huge story of human, that it's driving towards something. And somehow come to a place where we can trust that we're playing the part in God's plan that he asked us to play. And Daniel's hope was built on the fact that he believed he would live forever. And Daniel, the kids are having fun. Um, we're almost there. We're going to land this plane. So just stick with me two minutes, okay? This is the final thought. Daniel believed that he was going to live forever and that his life would matter after he died, both for himself in eternity and for the generations that were going to come after him. And so I want to ask you two questions in closing. How would you live... If, if you knew you were going to live forever, right? So if you knew that it wasn't going to just be your, your time on these 70 years, that, that it would matter forever and ever and ever, the things you do in these 70 years, how would you live? What would you prioritize? What, kind of, what, would, you, what, what would you invest your time into? If you knew you would live forever, what would be the things that would last and then the second thing, which is closely tied to that question, is how would you live differently 
perhaps this week, if you really believed that this city was your home and that your neighbors were your family? How would you live if you believed you would live forever and that the people around you were your family? What would change? And I don't want to tell you what to think about all these issues, although I have what I believe the Bible teaches about some of these things, but I want to challenge you not, not to give you what to think on every issue in life, but to challenge you how to think about them. To care to see these things in the lens that God sees them through. And the story that he's writing. How would you live if you knew you would live forever and if all the people around you were your family? Let's pray. God,